Um, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is David Jenkinson. I'm Editor-in-Chief and Managing Director of C21 Media. And welcome to this session, Schedule Watch, What Do Buyers Want? Uh, the information for this session is based on our ongoing Schedule Watch strand. If you haven't see seen that, uh, I'd recommend checking it out online. All of the people on this panel have been interviewed in depth on that, on that strand. And we're going to find out from them today exactly what it is that they're looking for, the anatomy of their channels, the anatomy of the deals that they've done most recently that define where they're going next and to find out a little bit more about the shows that, that will excite them. Um, we're going to keep it nice and open so if you do have a question at any time just put your hand up and I'll stop every 15 minutes if I don't see any hands to see if there are, there are questions. I'm just going to ask by, um, uh, I'm just going to start by asking each of the, uh, of the panellists to briefly introduce themselves and explain a little bit about how their business is different now to the way it was a year ago. And what we're really looking to find out is what are the things that are changing uh, in the past year and then what will change going forward in the next 12 months. So uh, individually, Paul, Adina, Jules and Frank, starting with Paul, tell us who you are and what you do. Hello, um, Paul DeBenedettis, I'm Senior Vice President of Content Strategy for Disney Channels Worldwide. Um, that involves scheduling uh, across our linear networks as well as all of our digital platforms, acquisitions and co-productions for Disney Channel, Disney XD and Disney Junior. And what have been the big movers for you this year? If you were th in the last 12 months, what has defined your business? I think the launch of Watch, which is our, our uh, TV Everywhere video platform, uh, it's something now more than ever that we don't really think of ourselves as just a linear television screen in a, in a, in a, in a family's house. Um, um, I look at content right now as a means to distribute a message about the Disney brand uh, and all that we have, uh, have to offer to the audience, uh, no matter where they're at. So for us now, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful moment uh, for us to be able to use those platforms to distribute our message and distribute our content every single place that a kid and a family wants to, re wants to watch us. Um, it's really exciting. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity, and that's something that you know, we've all been looking at in the past couple of years, and I feel like this past year, we've actually delivered on that. It's going beyond just web video. Uh, now having that um, portal uh, anywhere uh, you want to go. Cool. Well, we'll come back and talk in more detail about the shows and the, and the strategies that have defined that. But by way of introduction, Adina... Can I go last? Um, no, no, you have to go second, because I've <laughs> got you on a list. I want to talk after you. <laughs> how, how have the last 12 months been what's defined uh, your business? How long is this panel? This isn't... And let's, let me think about this. No, I think, I think if I had to pick one defining moment for us... Uh, change this year versus last year is, is definitely, I think we spend an inordinate amount of time trying to see where our viewers are at all times because uh, the, the tablet, the mobile devices, everything, the, the, just the sheer volume of screens that children can consume content on has increased and we need to be wherever they are. And just so we're trying to focus as best we can to provide the best possible content so that they can consume us on their screens. I'm being very inarticulate. I guess what I'm trying to say is we are trying to keep up with our viewers. They're moving faster than we are uh, in the media. And, and it, I think it's probably the best time for any producer to be in the kids' business because there is such a need for great content right now. And if I could just add to that point, I think the other thing is the, the kids that are watching us want new and they want exciting and they want events. And we need to be offering that to them on a very regular basis. So, you know, even the way we approach developing content and acquiring content has, has shifted this year. Oh, well, it'd be good to come back and talk a little bit more about how that has, has actually changed. Mm -hmm. But uh, moving on again, Jules, sort of set the scene, what's been keeping you up nights for the past year? Do you not want to know who I am first? <laughs> or I, I don't do anything to, I'll just introduce myself briefly for those of you who don't know who I am. I'm Jules Bork, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Programming and Acquisitions at uh, Nickelodeon. Um, I look after acquisitions for worldwide and or for programming for all our international uh, networks. 
And what's keeping me up at night? Um, one thing was my renovation that I was doing on an apartment. But other than that, <laughs> where my job is concerned, um, we have been talking a lot about post-millennials at Nickelodeon, uh, and I think everybody has. It is a different audience. These are ch children that are born where a mobile device at a one, two-year-old is a normal thing. It is, it is completely astounding to me at my age, which I won't reveal right here, but how uh, that has changed. And uh, as Paul and Adina are saying, it's uh, the same for us. It's kids are everywhere, they're using their tablets everywhere, and we need to find content for them quickly and very, very fast. I think the biggest challenge for us in the last year has been how fast we need to turn around our content. So we have a pilot. We Internally, the expectation is we want it quicker than ever. The, the two-year gestation period that we used to have, uh, that uh, gets chipped away of more and more because our audience demands it, and uh, we need to do that for them. Cool. Thank you. Um, Frank, just uh, briefly introduce yourself to who you are, what you do, and uh, again, what, what have been the highlights of the last 12 months? Well, obviously, I'm last, so thank you for that. Um, well, my name is Frank Dietz. I'm in charge of uh, acquisitions, in, in a larger sense, content supply for Super RTL for the German uh, network. Uh, it says RTL Disney Fernsehen up here, which means we have two shareholders. And it's a very interesting scenario because one of our shareholders, Disney, has decided to do their own free TV channel as of uh, January next year. So that really kept us busy because it gives us a, a larger, substantial hole in our schedule. So for the last 12 months, we've been really busy to fill that hole. And to be honest, we've been quite successful with it. So we've been in the market for the last 18 years. So we are a grown-up channel, so to say, but uh, have been number one for the last 15 years. And when you talk about general missions, it's more to keep that position for the next years to come. Okay. And it's going to be a really exciting scenario altogether. And some big changes to come in your area, which we'll, which we'll, which we'll come to a little bit later. Um, we're going to start by just putting uh, uh, each of the uh, different channels' grids up. Um, just one of the channels. This is not to specifically look at uh, the schedule itself, but to give you an idea of what's on those channels and then to talk a little bit uh, w w about the detail of the programming that's, that's driving those schedules. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit more to, uh, to Paul about, uh, about what's happening with Disney. So if you could s uh, s slip the... Uh the slide over there and let's have a look at what's, what, what's going on on the, uh, on the big channel in terms of the schedule grid. Do I press anything here? <laughs> okay. It, um, it basically just gives you a, a, a bit of an idea about what's, pl what's currently playing uh, on, on the channel. Can we, can we talk specifically about the, the most recent shows that you uh, have on the channel that have debuted uh, in the last 12 months and why those shows were chosen and how they're performing? Yeah, sure. Um, coming out of a, a wildly successful original movie, Team Beach Movie, which launched in the US and then most of the world this past fall, uh, we were able to launch a new um, scripted um, uh, live action sitcom called Live and Maddie. Uh, launched about uh, four or five weeks ago in the U.S., and you'll see that uh, launching around the world. Some territories have already launched it. And as much as that's our, our linear grid, it, it really just becomes um, a, a place um, uh, for folks to come to us in either live or DVR viewing, but at the same time, it really is our content offering. It's a representative of all the content that we have, uh, both on our linear platform, uh, set-top uh, box um, VOD as well as our watch VOD. So it, it really represents what is um, living uh, and breathing across our platforms today, not just on the linear, but as well as uh, also on the digital platforms. Um, what are the top criteria these days in terms of green lighting a show? I mean, you know, why would a show like that uh, get the button pressed on it? Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, the show was creator-driven. There was a vision from day one of what that show was that's in, in Live and Maddie. It also, um, the only way we would green light it um, is if we had a, an amazing talent. And we have an amazing talent in Doug Cameron. Uh, so it's exciting to have that next tween star, someone that we really believe in because of the ability for her to connect with the audience, to be relative to the audience, for our audience to see her as an aspirational character. Um, 
those are all the sort of the criteria. In addition, it has to be really funny. I think Adina said that now more than ever, the audience wants to laugh and they want to laugh out loud. Um, so the, the humor has to be there. It has to be relatable. Um, the pacing has to be there. It has to be quick. I think now more than ever, kids can, you know, you're just a click away. It used to be, you know, the remote. Now it's a click. You know, it's so easy. There's hundreds upon thousands and then millions of things you can watch online. We're competing with YouTube. So, and I think what's different for all of us versus the YouTube is we have the ability to tell story. And that story has to be confined in a way that is compelling to the audience. And you've made a big push over the last few years to work with third party um, companies. I mean, you tell us a little bit about that strategy and, uh, and why it's important for you. What, what's the thinking behind that rather than developing house? It, you know, in the past couple of years, we've been very open um, to working with third party. I might say in the past, we probably were, were a little bit uh, less aggressive. You know, the marketplace has changed. We all, need, we all need content. We all need content to fuel our platforms. And it, it's almost impossible to do it all alone. Um, certainly, the things that we do internally are our big priorities, the things that we put tremendous amount of time and resource against. But in the past year, we've probably done something like 22 global deals um, um, in addition to those that we did locally. All of us are looking to fuel our platforms. We're looking for content that complements things that we're developing in-house which makes, I think, a big challenge for all of us here. Uh, we're not just looking for kids' content. We're looking for content that sits alongside the original programming that we're doing. And today, in the digital space, it can't just be any kids' content. Um, I think for each of us, we have really strong brands, and the content that we, have, we choose needs to sit alongside our original and needs to mean something as it relates to the brand and the way in which kids are coming to us for that content. Uh, tell me about the push into China. How is that going to see the brand evolve? I, I, I think right now it's sort of too soon to speak. Uh, you know, it's all about investing in content, uh, investing in an infrastructure, but more to come. Local on, uh, partners, local production. Local partners, local production, as well as utilizing uh, all the experience that Disney Channels has to offer as it relates to the development and production of original content. And I thought the, the Violetta project was interesting this year, you know, the Latin American sort of talent about that was sort of ongoing, quite a different sort of content for you. Could you explain the sort of rationale behind that property? Uh, yeah, and you know. Maybe it, set the scene with what it was all about. Sure. Um, Violetta is a scripted telenovela um, that originated from our Latin American team. Um, it was an amazing concept that they brought to the table. It's also a really fantastic example of a local, um, local original series that was developed out of our production hub in Latin America that is now becoming a show that travels outside of Latin America. And it was not something that was just developed in the US and then went to Global Partners. It was developed in LATAM. They had a very specific need for telenovela. Uh, I think they took a little bit of the magic of Camp Rock and high school musical that worked as DCOMs, and they found a way to bring that into a traditional format of a telenovela, but they didn't do it for adults. They brought, it, they brought that format to something that would be relatable for tweens and teens. Um, they did 80 episodes in season one, God, God bless them. They did 80 episodes in season two. Uh, we've been able to uh, dub that, and it has now traveled to many other parts around the globe. It's not something that airs in the US today, something that we always explore, but they created a wonderful, compelling story surrounded um, by a, a, um, a really amazing lead actress. Um, they brought something like 40 original songs to each season. It's a tremendous uh, production for them um, and something that we're really proud of. And non-scripted reality is starting to make a, a, a bigger play on, on, on the channel. Tell us about the, what's going on in that space and the challenge to make more of that happen. Yeah, um, for me, it's something that I love. I, I mean, I came from MTV where um, most of our content was reality-based and non-scripted. Um, um, for Disney Channel, for so long, uh, most of our success, or all of our success, was on scripted, um, um, scripted content. And I think now more than ever, we need to be able to diversify our offering. And sometimes the reality-based content allows us to go in places that we just don't go in live action. Um, I think it's a complement to the things that we're doing. Um, we'll test many, it allows us to test many different formats. I think Jules also mentioned timing. It's also something that we're able to get up and running a little quicker uh, than some of the uh, scripted and certainly animation fronts. Um, so we'll try a lot of things out this year. We'll see what works, what connects with the audience, and, and, and we'll go from there. Cool. 
Um, thanks for that. Well, we'll come back and talk more about some of those trends and maybe some further development uh, sure. that you have uh, in the works at the moment. Um, Dean, I'm going to flip to your grid. I know that this, again, is uh, just a launcher for shows in many ways. Is that you? It is. Yes. It is. <laughs> God for that. Great. Okay, so that just gives you all a sort of an idea of the sort of stuff that's playing on the channel. You don't need to even look at that because you, you, you know already, Adina. But comedy yes, yes, is playing. Comedy is playing really, really strongly at the moment, isn't it? That's been, that's been one of the focuses of development over the past year. It has. I think that what we have discovered is that comedy... We always knew that kids came to us to laugh and they associate our brand with, with comedy. But our action shows are also very funny. And it is now a must-have in our action shows that there be an element of funny in there that is really organic to the show. So it's not just a guy in a suit battling the bad guy. There has to be a richer story. There's something funny going on that kids can really connect with. And uh, that's been a big shift for us. Can you talk about some of the properties that best represent that and how you go about the process of uh, deciding whether or not they're funny? Well. The, the, yes, I can give you an example. I think Ben 10 is a fantastic example of a property that was a way ahead of its time. It is funny, he's fearless, it's full of action. That's kind of our evergreen action show. I think probably a more recent example of that would be Lego Ninjago, which was a real hit for us and it really demonstrated how you could have something very, very funny and accessible to kids. Also, we found that a lot of girls were watching it, which was very surprising for us. Also, you're also uh, developing your third-party collaboration as well. Yes. You know, it seems that working with um, producers outside of the group is increasing across, across the, the spectrum. Um, what is it that those producers are bringing to, the, to you, that you that you don't have in-house? And again, are the particular projects that are typical of the sort of things you want to develop with those, those kinds of producers? Let me see if I can answer that. Uh, I would say that Turner, Cartoon Network specifically, has always had a very healthy balance of third-party shows and original content. And, and that's, it's a difficult model to sustain, David, because as Paul articulated, we have to find content that we believe is going to help sustain and complement our original programming. And you have to take risks, you have to find something that feels innovative, that feels different, but not too different that it alienates the kids who are coming to you for certain kinds of shows. So it is, it, it's very much, you know, 50-50. Do we think we're funny? We hope we're funny when we're picking our shows. But I think you know the difference between a show that makes you really laugh as opposed to a show that's just okay. And I think our budgets are at a place where we can't afford to buy just okay or make it. It has to be great and it has to be funny. And I would encourage everyone in the room who's a producer, take the time you need to make your show as good as it can possibly be before you pitch it. Don't pitch it too soon because we, we pick up very few shows and you have to get it right. So, you know, we're hoping to be inspired by the things that you present us. So Cartoon Network is ultimately a boys network, but you yes. do have a, you know, a girls audience and that seems to be get, getting stronger, that profile. Just give us a, a, a snapshot of how the demographics are changing at the, at the moment and how that's informing your, your commissioning and your development strategy. Well, I think, you know, boys, watch more animation than girls do. And, and, and as illustrated by the fact that we even have Adult Swim, which is a top rated men 18 to 34 network. We, we have always celebrated the fact that we have a, a very large boy audience, but we love it when the girls come too. So we always say we're boy targeted, girl inclusive. And uh, what was the second part of the question that you asked me? How is the girls, how are you developing for, for girls more? Or, right. or are you? Not really. I think we're developing the best possible show that's kind of in line with the kinds of shows that we've done in the past. Uh, you will find that some of the more recent originals on the air have ensemble casts. Uh, and They have very rich, rich stories with different worlds. Shows like Adventure Time, Regular Show. It's this very incredibly rich 
uh, lush programming that has something for everyone. And I think that you can have lumpy space princess appeal to the girls, but she's not a princess the way perhaps Disney would serve up a princess. We have to identify what's our space you know, with our viewers. What, what is that and occupy that and really own it? What were you most pleased with on the, on the programming front over the last 12 months? Was the one project that you really thought got, got away in a, new, in a new way and helped redefine where you go next? We hope to be surprised every time we put something on the air and that it exceeds our expectations. I think we've had, you know, hits and misses. I would say in the last year, the most exciting launch we've had was Uncle Grandpa, which just launched a couple of weeks ago on the air, and it is just a great show. It's very funny. Again, it's serving up something very different to the other shows that we've picked up or made, uh, but it's going to occupy a very special place on our schedule for a long time. Cool. Okay. Well, we'll come back and talk more about developments and, uh, and other stuff a little later. Mm -hmm. Jules, I believe this is uh, your sort of... Uh Launcher, again, not, not necessarily so much uh, uh, in, important in terms of where things play, but definitely in terms of what's on that grid. So for you, that gives you a, a good picture of what's happening. Can you, again, just tell us a little bit about what's working best and why? Uh, yeah, I picked a UK schedule, so I, we have, that was 55 schedules to pick from, so I thought I'd pick a different country than the US. Uh, this, still though, what it shows is these are, all of these are, this is from three o'clock. So this is all home produced. There is obviously a quiet content on our network as well. It doesn't show here, but these are uh, a mix of our evergreens like SpongeBob, as well as uh, our top uh, live action shows. And uh, then House of Anubis, which this must have been, this probably was before the summer. So House of Anubis was the third season of the show. We started three years ago out of the UK, which was originated, the show that originated in uh, Holland and Belgium. With us. We did that with Studio 100, so this was the third season. This was a big hit in the UK. It has been doing very well for us. So a great example, I think, from a show that originated outside of uh, the US and made its way back to the US. So um, happy with that. That was really one, probably one of the highlights uh, still for me because we worked on it from the very infancy. So it was great to see this go to three full seasons. And um, the other shows on here is like, you know, iCarly Victorious. Uh, Dan Schneider, uh, he's our in-house creator that has, uh, has, has been responsible for many hits, Drake and Josh, so he won a one for many years, and his latest show, Sam and Cat, uh, which launched in the US in um, end of May, has been very, very successful for us. It, is a, um, it stars Jeanette McCurdy and Ariana Grande, who were both uh, in other shows, so they're characters from iCardi and Victorious that became sort of a crossover into this new show where they're working together. And for those of you who know, Ariada Grande is now also a big musical star, which is obviously great, and she's very, very popular with our, with our audience, as well as Jeanette. Um, so that is one of the exciting things that happened, I think. And SpongeBob is still there, and he has been there for the now for 12 years, still drawing in the viewers, and we love him for it. And uh, very excited about this, that there's a movie coming. Paramount is going to be releasing a movie uh, later next year, end of 2014 which we're really super excited about. I quite like your mantra, hearts, smarts, and farts. That's how you define your programming. I didn't come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say that. So how does, how does that sort of work its way out? So it's, uh, it's sort of everything that makes, it's really what Paul and Adina are saying as well. It is comedy. We are looking for pure comedy. That is probably the biggest shift for us. We have um, dabbled in other genres where we have gone a little bit more drama. We have gone a little bit more serious in some of our shows. But for us this year, it's all about about pure comedy. Uh, kids need to laugh, they want to laugh all the time, and that's what we try and bring them with the shows. Cool, okay, well we'll come back to some, to develop some more of those thoughts late, later again. I mean, Frank, um, uh, pr an interesting year for you, and definitely an interesting year going forward. Uh, I'm gonna put up your, uh, a recent schedule, and I know that's all gonna change, but maybe we can talk about why. Um, so w w how are you positioned right now and what's going to happen in, t in 2014? Well, we consider ourselves as a gender neutral channel, so we don't really have that focus on boys as Cartoon Network has, for instance. Um, as you go through our uh, schedule, you see uh, still some, some Disney shows appearing. As I explained, um, 
our contract with Disney will expire as of 1st of January, so there won't be any Phineas and Ferbs and any uh, Good Luck Charlies and any uh, any Jessies any longer. So uh, our strategy was really to to find ways to fill that gap and. For instance, a live action contest in the larger sense, as Disney has it, uh, won't be pop uh, probably possible to maintain in the future. So uh, for us, it was key to, to go along that alley where we define ourselves as a very animated, animation focused channel. Mm -hmm. So you will see a lot of uh, animated uh, shows on that grid ranging from Angelo Rules to uh, Almost Naked Animals originating from Canada, from Nine Story. And uh, when we knew that or learned that Disney is going to, to release their own channel, we had to make sure that not only from a quantity but also from a quality point of view, we find an adequate replacement. And therefore, one of the pieces of the puzzle to make sure that we mm. fill the gap that will become uh, eminent next year uh, we it's signed very heavily animation, isn't it? It's Would very you, heavy animation. It's, it's very, as I said, gender neutral. You won't see the typical action show you would find on a, on a Cartoon Network, for, for instance. Uh, boys' action always has been uh, a hard game for us. So we, we have to uh, find shows that are relatable to, to the kids. Uh, it's more the kind of context they see in their school environment. Best example would be Angelo. So that's, that's really a show that has that comedy element that really reflects uh, the daily experiences of kids in the core target age group of six to nine. So that's what, what we're really focusing on. And as you can see in the schedule, that's kind of a premiere to us because it's the weekend when actually Dragons, uh, the Riders of Berg is going to be launched. That's gonna be our first uh, DreamWorks series. And it was kind of a twist of fate in a way that DreamWorks decided to go series doing spin-offs of their movies while we were looking for, for content, so it was a perfect match. It was really something that happened at the, uh, at the right time, and we had the, the craving or the need for that kind of quantity uh, in the market. There aren't that many channels that can actually accommodate Turbo and all the, the other uh, great series that are about to come. So the Disney f f fueled about 30% of the channel, That's I believe, right. and, yes. um, DreamWorks relationships a new one which will help uh, support the, the, the schedule going forwards. Yes. How, how much other content are you looking to replace that 30% that or are all the deals all done? To be honest, a lot. Uh, and I think that's pretty good news to the independent producers in the market because as you can see in the, ch uh, uh, in, in the schedule here already, there is a large choice of independent productions and I must say, looking at the panel here as well, we are kind of uh, you know, you see these big uh, cruise ships kind of internationally operating uh, channels, Disney, Cartoon Network, uh, Nickelodeon, and we are kind of specialized in our market. We know what's best uh, for our kids, and we don't have to deal with, let's say, the group politics uh, in a larger sense. So we can really pick uh, the shows we, we like, and as of 1st of January, we, we declare it our Independence Day, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, and, and again, you're looking for broad skewing animated comedy. Uh, comedy keeps returning, doesn't it? Is, 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 is that stuff? Because that's shared across all of the panel. Yes, it is, yeah. And if I look in, uh, into our past, kind of, we had SpongeBob on air, we have Phineas and Ferb on air, we have uh, shows we share with Cartoon Network. So it's, it's kind of, uh, for us at least, the best that's out in the market, the shows we can we can present to our audience. Will we see more live action in future? You think? A lot less, to be honest, because okay. uh, from our relationship with Disney, we had a lot of live action, but that because of uh, the the facts we mentioned before, that will change. Okay. Yes. So um, I'm just going to pause for some questions. If anybody has any, and you've probably got much better ones than me, could you put your hands up and ask any? One of the panelists, I'm sure, would be happy to take a question on particular programs or genres or yeah. anything else. Could you wait for the microphone, please? There's one over here. Um, have we got a microphone? I just saw this Nickelodeon and Disney, they focus on the Canada content. Is there any reason behind it? So, Disney focusing on Canadian content. Why? Um, would you consider productions from France or Germany or elsewhere? 
I'd be open to content from anywhere. At the end of the day, first and foremost is a great show with a great creator behind the wheel that's driving character and story that's going to be compelling to kids. And then we'll go through who and where it's from and what the business arrangement could be. But you start out with a really great content. And same for us. It's like we do have we have some shows with Canada. We did a show with Breakthrough. We um, Rocket Monkeys, which we're really happy with. But we've also done shows in other markets. We're doing a show with Marathon in France right now, which is launching next year, called Get Blake. And we're doing stuff from the UK. So it's really, as Paul said, it can come from anywhere. It's it's really. I think that is really what is changing for us a lot. Is the con and you'll see it. I think on all our networks. Uh, the content is really not, there is still a lot of our homegrown content out of the US, but I think we are completely open. It's from every country in the world we are considering content. Clearly, it's attractive to make programming with a Canadian partner from a credit perspective, um, and now the UK is uh, attractive as well. Is that going to change the way that, that any of you develop? Not really, no. It's, it's nice. That's definitely, yeah, there is obviously, the, the credits are always really nice, but I don't think it should be the driving force behind a decision of whether we should make a show or not. Okay. There's another question at the back. Can you say, let us know who you are before Hi, you ask? Hi, Rachel Morell from the MIPCOM Daily. Um, you're all saying that comedy is really crucial going forward, and at the same time, we often hear these things are cyclical. Do you expect the pendulum to swim, swing the other way, or is this permanent? Um, we always talk about things being cyclical, so I completely agree with you. I think comedy is just a constant for all of us. I think what's going to shift is what you combine with your comedy. So comedy will always be the anchor because it repeats the best, it has the longest shelf life, and uh, you can introduce it to a new audience pretty much you know, with, with every season. But I think what you're gonna find is we do need action, we do need drama, we do need mystery. There's always going to be a need for diversity of genres on any network. The question is, what is, what is the return of investment on these properties? Are they gonna get a rating? Are they gonna make money? Are they gonna sell toys? You know, we're all asking questions about the business behind our, our shows. Not every show can just deliver a rating. Some shows have to do more than that, work harder. Action shows tend to be those shows. And it's very, very hard right now in the action world to really break out. It's even harder, by the way, to do that with comedy. It's very hard. Um, or perhaps the diversity of genres within a specific format. So the same way broadcast television over the past 10 years, we've seen in the adult space where the, the traditional drama brought in elements of music, brought in elements of comedy. Um, you know, is someone going to come to me today with a, a sitcom that has elements of maybe action, elements of drama? You know, we, we appreciate that. So while the, the genres were always welcome to hearing more specific um, dramas, uh, specific genres, um, and while comedy is the thing that is driving us today, maybe there is just a new way of delivering on what is a half hour sitcom a half hour animated series, an 11 minute animated series. Is there a different way to tell that story? Could you flip back to the holding slide, please? Because um, we've sort of done with the grids now. Um, there was another question down here, gentleman at the front, can you let us know who you are? Hi, I am uh, Manish from Purple Turtle India. I have uh, basically two questions. At what stage should a IP holder uh, contact channels? For example, uh, we have a successful publishing program with Purple Turtle Books. So is it appropriate to um, make the Bible a pilot episode or it is, uh, if the books are doing well, any one of you would be interested, that's one. And then uh, uh, it could be a repetition of the previous question. Um, India doesn't have tax credits and those subsidies that's happening. So does it put uh, a country like India or any other country which doesn't have this on a um, disadvantage or a negative list? Okay, so um, at what stage does it come with a project and uh, is, is uh, coming out of India or any ter other territory that doesn't have a, a better tax credit relationship uh, a, a hindrance? Um, like to take that? I think first, I would always tell people, please, if you, you have to think about the project and you have to think about our networks. 
and think where you should pitch it. You can't pitch it to all of us because, as we hopefully have explained, while we're all looking for comedy, we also are very distinct in what we need. So that is the first thing I think I would advise you is like look at our networks where your brand or your IP fits the best. Then come with the original idea, like what would a series be, and maybe in just a brief synopsis, to really go out and make a pilot. It's, it's, a lot, it's expensive, and I don't think it's fair because it's, it might be completely off. So first, come with the initial idea, see if it's something that, we would, uh, that would fit one of us, and take it from there, and then wait for the feedback from uh, one of the broadcasters. And on your second question, I think I said it earlier, it's, it is, yes, it is definitely a benefit for tax credits to be there, but it is, again, for us, it's really about, and I think for all of us, it's about the content that you bring. I'd agree, and I would just add to that, define the pitch. You know, while you have publishing, if you're coming to TV, really be able to be clear to us on what that concept is, what is the story you're going to tell, who are the characters that you're going to basically tell, 26, 20 episodes, for a year, what are those stories that it's very clear the project that you're pitching? I think the things that go astray, and I think Adina said it best, is people that may pitch a little too soon. Uh, and then the project is wide open, and then it's really hard for us to sink our teeth in and fundamentally understand what is the show that you're pitching? What is the thing that I'm gonna agree to do with you? Uh, otherwise, we're sort of confused. And then I think it, it, it sets the project astray. Right, thank you. There's another question down the front. Hello, uh, Stuart from the MIP blog. Um, I wanted to ask what, how much you're doing with trying to build brands off TV, then bring them back, for example, with apps or with YouTube or with games on your site. I know you've got Wes and Water and you've got um, Annoying Orange Book TV. Are you doing a lot more of that where they'll start somewhere else and then you'll bring them over? Or maybe what are you doing that's starting elsewhere at the moment and bringing it over? Because it seems to be now part of development, isn't it? Who would like to take that? off-screen development for on-screen amplification? Well, spontaneously, I think it's hard enough to build TV brands and make them successful. So, of course, we have corporations with uh, various partners where you have uh, online reality and try to benefit from that and maybe translate it into a series or something. But in, in general, our key focus is to make our TV brands big and then support them with the adequate platforms. We do, at Nickelodeon, do create content in other parts of the business. So we launched in the US, we launched the Nickelodeon app, which launched uh, before the summer. So we are creating content specifically for that app. And we also have recently commissioned a number of uh, digital pieces specifically for digital uh, animated uh, content that we are going to test on our digital platforms. And they potentially could evolve into a TV show. So yes, we do do that. And, and for us at the Cartoon Network, digital is actually under the content umbrella. So it is one division. So when you're developing IP, you're taking into account all of the different ways in which that uh, intellectual property can uh, not just originate, but how you're going to serve it up. Is this going to start out as an app and then evolve into something else, or is it just going to be that? And really kind of diversify that uh, portfolio, because as we said earlier, we really do need to think about our, our intellectual property with a very different lens in terms of we have to be wherever the consumer is going to be. So is this better as a show? Is this better as an app? Is it better as both? It's a consideration for everything that we make. And certainly, by the same token, every show that we get pitched, it's really great to know you know, what, what, what have you as producers been thinking about for your intellectual property that we can then take on and amplify with, with our dot coms or, you know, our mobile devices, our, whatever it is that we have that we can partner with you on. But we also, I just want to add to this, sorry, I'm very long-winded, okay. but, but we do uh, check the internet. We are always there looking for content to source. There are some great creative ideas out there, but people just need help you know, telling that story, but there's great animation, there's great, you know, user-generated content, you just have to search, so we're constantly looking out there to see if maybe there's an undiscovered something. We have a variety of original short-form content that we've developed for each of our brands, uh, most of which was developed specifically for online use and, and uh, digital use. Uh, we've been fortunate in a couple of examples that have actually made their way to Linear as a second window. Um, but I, I think the opportunity is there. 
Um, certainly a uh, watch for us is such a significant priority in 2013 and 14 that we'll look to have more video on those platforms that maybe originates and is developed for those platforms. But at the end of the day for me, you know, I, I, I'm a content strategist, so for me to develop content only for one platform it, is not the most efficient way for you, me to leverage my resources. And also, I have a tremendous amount of platforms that are branded where kids can access Disney. So for me, it's really using the platform to distribute the content as opposed to being very focused on a particular platform and develop for that platform. Cool. There was a question just back there. Did you have a microphone? Jen, could you put your hand up? We'll come to you next if we could get a microphone over to this gentleman. In the meantime, Elizabeth, you had a question. Yes, uh, Elizabeth Guider. Uh, I write for... Uh uh, the Hollywood Reporter. Uh, you know, we've noticed here at MIPCOM over the last few years, and this is a follow-up to what Paul was saying about drama, just how uh, interesting storytelling has gotten on the adult side from places like Scandinavia, Israel, now Turkey is the hot place. I'm wondering in kids, if each of you could say, where have you seen, yes, animation looks good everywhere. I've seen a lot of it, it looks fabulous the storytelling, what territories, what new territories are you seeing, are you being surprised by in the kids area? Where you're thinking, wow, I mean, we know Britain, the US, the Netherlands. Where else are you seeing, wow, these folks have really caught up? Can I have one country from each of you? <laughs> Just one. Very demanding, very demanding woman. <laughs> well. It's, uh, there are two realities. There's, one is, of course, the creative side. The other one is the potential to actually uh, develop the show to, to the level where it actually gets produced. So we have a lot of great ideas coming from all around the world, but at the end of the day, will they make it to the TV channel? I have one example which really surprised us, uh, and I think we jointly had that experience with Cartoon Network. Uh, it's a show called Lazy Town. It actually came from Iceland. And uh, I think a lot of you in the room know about that show. It's about healthy eating, and it was a really creative, fresh approach. Of course, it's, it's been a couple of years ago, but that's the one that uh, comes to my mind very spontaneously uh, answering your question. Jules? That was mine, because we did, <laughs> <laughs> because we did Lazy no, Tongue no, on Nickelodeon what, first. I think, I think the question is, what's but, next? Okay, I what's next the after what's Iceland? Next? Uh, Greenland? Nothing, uh, nothing. No, Greenland. for us, I think, I think, well, to be honest, I think Holland and Belgium, for Benelux was, and I, maybe I'm a little biased because I'm Dutch, but we are, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of content coming out of Holland that people know, and it's mainly in the reality space, The Voice and, and Big Brother, those are the shows that are really big out of Holland. For us, and Anubis was a big, that was a big deal for us, uh, to come have something that was very local, that was able to translate to all of our markets around the world. I think that's, that, was, um, that was definitely a surprise. I wasn't surprised there was good content in that market, that, uh, definitely for that market, but to bring it to a US audience was definitely something that I think was, uh, mm. was interesting. And to, um, to Paul's point earlier, is it going to telenovelas for us to bring, te we've, some of our telenovelas out of Latin America, also we've gone with them to the Philippines, and those have really, really been successful there. So that is, again, but it's probably a little bit more, not that surprising, because that's what they're good at. Adina? I think for us, if, if I had to pick two recent examples of, of writing that has just been fantastic, Gumball coming out of the UK is a great example of, of a show that really traveled and did not originate you know, in our hometown, but really, boy, do we love that show. And number two, Denmark, uh, Lego, with their content. I know they do a lot of writing from all over the world, but it has really been a fabulous surprise to see new talent emerging from from other parts of the world that we might have not necessarily sought, you know, on our own. Cool. I have three different platforms, so I might take the liberty of providing one for each. I'll say Germany on the acquisition side, we uh, acquired a series called Wolf Blood, which is a little different for us, um, a, a bit of a uh, mixed genre of drama meets anthology, meets a little bit of horror, but not quite horror. Um, it's a series that has launched in many territories already. It just launched in the US uh, this past week. Uh, so that was really exciting for us to try something out um, that came from Germany. 
Um, um, and then I, I'd say um, for us on the original side, Argentina and the team that has been developing not just telenovelas, but actually some of the sitcoms as well. Um, and then I, uh, surprisingly, I might add for Disney Junior, we've had some tremendous partnership with those in Ireland uh, that have been able to deliver really quality storytelling, quality animation, um, and, and great partnership there. So, Cool. Okay, there's a question here. Uh, let us know who you are. Uh, Trond Stora from uh, the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. And um, it's about uh, knowing the audience. And, uh, like RTL, Super RTL, you were, was talking about knowing the audience, uh, but I couldn't see any Germans shows uh, when we was looking at the schedule. And uh, how important is it to know the country you are launching content in? So uh, is a locally produced show necessary for a local audience or is it broad enough that it can, a project can come from anywhere and should you have more German shows on the schedule? Well, it's, it's probably called the frequently asked question, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know there have been a lot of discussions about the, the production la landscape in Germany and how markets pos position themselves in, in the production uh, internationally. And uh, I must say that, uh, and that's what I mentioned before, the financing reality for the shows is, is a lot different from country to country. So if you look at the, the, the kinds of subsidies and the kinds of support money you, you get from various institutions, if you look at France, if you look at Canada and compare it to Germany, it's, it's not equal. And I must say that uh, there needs, uh, there's room for improvement on, uh, on, that, uh, on that side. But uh, in general, and I think you mentioned it before, Paul, um, it's, it's about the content. It's not about the origin, it's where the great content comes from. And I don't mind if a show comes from Australia or Finland or New Zealand, you name it. It's about the right show that fits in the portfolio we showed. So another frequently asked uh, question, what kind of content are you actively looking for? It's the one that fits in that portfolio. And we have about a, well, a two-digit number of shows that are currently incubating, where we discuss the shows with the producers, our editorial team is giving notes and input, and we see whether it really meets uh, the criteria we need for the channel. And once all these boxes are ticked, then we go ahead and finance it, or we, we take the rights we actually need. And that's the level of engagement we, we have. And okay. therefore, for German productions, it's, it's not whether it comes from Germany that it actually makes a hit show. Yeah, I'm gonna move on to another question because, uh, yeah, so I'm gonna take this gentleman's question and then that lady's question over there. So can you tell us who you are, please? Thank you, Hi, from Up Studios in China. So Paul touched very briefly at the beginning about China. I'm, I'm curious, are any of your companies very active in that market in terms of acquisition? Um, and from two standpoints, one from the creative talent that's there, because you've talked a lot about the UK or Ireland or Germany and other territories where there's a lot of great local talent, but in a country of 1.3 plus billion people, obviously a lot of talent there and I think often overlooked in terms of acquisitions. And secondly, also because it provides a huge local market. If the show is brought over globally, but also can be played domestically, uh, that seems to be a, an under-leveraged area. Uh, if you look at the slates, all of the, the great shows that you have, um, we haven't seen a lot of Chinese creators or creative shows on there, although I do applaud Nickelodeon for Ni Hao Kai Lan and uh, you know, et cetera. So there's a few examples, but very few, I'd say, overall. So is this an area that you're actively looking at? Who would like to take that? Yeah, I would say uh, to uh, expand on the point that I raised earlier as we're developing our team and there are actively pursuing projects in China, the most exciting thing about that is they're developing a team, they're growing a team, and I hope that we are able to tap into the market, which we are, by bringing on uh, gifted storytellers, gifted animators, those that are really going to bring not just that content to China, but hopefully content that can um, uh, reach and appeal to some of our other markets as well. And in doing that with the content, I'm hoping that they'll be able to expose the creative talent behind those projects as well. Okay. Any of the other guys got thoughts on that? Well, I was just gonna say, we take pitches uh, from Chinese producers and distribution companies as often as we do from other countries. We've never said, oh, we're not gonna talk to a Chinese distributor. I mean, it, it doesn't work that way. I know you know that. The fact of the matter is, 
it, it, it has as good a shot of being picked up as any show that we see. And it, it's just a matter of, of I think, uh, the storytelling being tailored a little bit more for our audience. There tend to be a lot of stories that we've been pitched coming out of China that are very, very complicated and very rich and they have a lot of backstory. And I think you need to simplify it and maybe tell a chapter of that and then you can do season two as your prequel and the back, you know, not throw the kitchen sink and everything in that one episode. It's too much. So I would say as a generalization, Storytelling is something that is, there's a great opportunity there. Absolutely, there's talent and, and you know, we would love to diversify our slate even more with, with uh, content emanating from China. Great, thank you for that question. Question over there, can you let us know who you are? From Source Animation. I wanted to know about um, edutainment series. Everything seems to be very much comedy based, but what about shows that are mainly comedy based but also have a learning aspect to them as well? Are any networks interested in that sort of thing? So what's the learning agenda for each of you at the moment? I think we mainly do that in our preschool shows. That's where uh, play and learn is very much a theme in all our um, Nickelodeon shows that we create. So that it's, they're always curriculum based. In our 6 to 11, um, we, have, we don't do that very much, to be frank. No, it's really where we are doing it very much is in preschool. Frank? Well, it's, uh, we mentioned the 30% loss coming from Disney and uh, the element of DreamWorks and new development and the third axis are actually in-house commission projects that go exactly in the, in the edit, uh, edutainment area. So we have shows on there based on backyard science, on uh, history and mystery, and for us it's, it's really crucial because uh, the German market, and we had that conversation last night over dinner, Jules, is a very traditional market and it's very much relying on, on, on parents. They're still watching what their kids are watching. So we have to come up with concepts where we actually bring that element of edutainment to the audience. And if you look at our competitor Kika, for instance, they're very successful with their edutainment formats. And it's definitely uh, an area we are going to expand in. Adina? Yeah. Uh, the Cartoon Network in the United States, we do not have a preschool platform, which is where educational television would uh, exist and live on our air. However, what we do have are pro-social initiatives, which we message a lot on our air, whether it's the Move It Movement campaign or the National Anti-Bullying campaign, which is now going global. I think there's ways of educating our viewers about things that we feel matter to them and that, or that they should care about without necessarily incorporating that into a show. So I would say our educational message probably comes through those initiatives. Not so much curriculum-based education, mm -hmm. but more giving messages uh, such as, you know, how we should behave within society, yes. bullying, that sort of thing. So more sort of ethical messages within a comedy format uh, rather than just slapstick comedy. You know, I think for, for us, just speaking for us, kids really come to us to just relax and, and they have, kids' lives are so complicated today. They go to school, they have after school, they have weekend, they have travel teams. And, and they're busier now than they've ever been before, and they have more choices. And I think television, or the content that, that all of you are providing, and the platforms that we offer, it gives them an opportunity to kind of disengage and, and immerse themselves in other experiences where they can just focus. And I, so we try not to be too earnest in that, oh, you know, be good to Billy, you know. But I think that you obviously want to have content where you're modeling good behavior, though you don't, I mean, I think all of us have very stringent standards and practices and common sense guidelines. You don't want to have a show where there's mean kids or, you, or if there are mean kids, you want them to have a realization that they're being mean and, you know, to recognize that behavior. But we also spend a lot of time, all of our brands, researching what is happening with kids and in kids' lives and what, what are those areas that we have to message to them, whatever it is, healthy eating, uh, exercise, like I said, bullying. It could be a, a slew of things. And I think actually that's one of the equalizers for all of us where not, not, not only are we trying to entertain, but we really, I think, make a great effort to super serve those kids in a way that maybe they're not getting them, those messages at home or at school. Okay, so uh, we're coming into the last five minutes now, so I'd just like to change the pace a bit. Um, Paul, if you could steal one show from any of the competitors <laughs> sitting on the podium right now, <laughs> Um, which show would you steal and why? I think I'm okay. No, no. 
You've got to steal oh. one. You've got to steal Ooh. one. Ooh. It's the format. <laughs> you don't necessarily need it, but you could steal it. <laughs> okay. Um, you know there's one. <laughs> You know, there really isn't, so this is kind of hard. I might say Adventure Time, because I think it is just a really smart show. I think to someone's point about genre and format, it's so out there and so bizarre, and I'm sure when the pitch first came, folks were like, what the hell? But I think it has just really great characters. I think it's really funny. I think the pacing is, is just fantastic. I think you could come in and out of it pretty easy. So while I really don't need it or necessarily want it on the channel, I, I'm a fan of it because I think creatively it, it just appeals to me and I think kids have responded to something like that. It's different, it's unique. Um, so, and I hope there's going to be more of that. I, I hope that opens the door to other creators thinking, God, what is it about this crazy show and those crazy characters? Cool. Adina? You know what? I will take any one of your shows happily and make it work, but I have to say, ugh, I just love SpongeBob so much. I think I can't get enough of that show. I think that show just gets better and better. It's like a good wine. What are the it elements, do you think, that make it so? It's it ultimately, it's, it's a buddy comedy. It's about friendship, about these two unlikely friends, dumb and dumber practically, where they, and, and the crazy cast of character. I love that they live underwater and they take showers and that they, <laughs> there's just everything about that show that you take, everything that you think that character should behave like and they flip it. And it's, you know, Mrs. Puff blows up. Everything about it. I think I've seen every episode and it's just, it's, it, it is, to me, the epitome. Jules, what's, what's going in your bag? Um, I think probably Phineas and Ferb. I love that show. I think it's funny. It's really, really well written. It would sit on our network, I think, really well, actually. Um, it's, if we had to pick one, that's probably one. But there's many, I think. Adventure Time, they're, they're all good. But if I can only pick one, I'll probably pick Phineas and Ferb. Because there's a lot of apps. Okay. That's also good for us. <laughs> <laughs> Frank? Well, to be honest, I would pick two, and it's actually SpongeBob and Phineas and Ferb, and for the simple reason, because we made them big in Germany, and that should belong to us. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> and um, so just wrapping up, um, if you could solve one big problem this year, Frank, if you've got one thing that you, that you need to, to, to solve, your biggest challenge, what is it? Well, to to manage to, to get the shows we need to keep the, the channel as successful as it was over the last 15 years. That's is there the one particular challenge. thing that you would need? Uh, is there a, a franchise, a brand, a, a style, or, or, or a particular type of show that will do that No, it's the you? mix of all. The mix. It's getting the right balance and making sure that we, once again, tick the right boxes and, and satisfy our audience. It's that simple okay. and that difficult. Yeah. yeah. Jules, what's your biggest problem? Uh, the debt ceiling. Um, I uh, would say get the shows quicker. For us, it's really about we need this content fast and we need it quick. And that is always, as a programmer, it's the biggest challenge. We see stuff in, in pilot and it's being created and it's absolutely great. And you want it now, you want it on your air, and you know you have to wait 18 months for it. And that is always the hardest. So what's the ideal, ideal time that you think is feasible within the next uh, year or two in terms of taking it from 18 months to what? What would, what would be acceptable, do you think, and doable? Doable is, um, I think, still 18 months. I think I'd like it to be shorter, into the sort of a year, 12 months, but it's hard, it's hard to do. I think, uh, to Paul's point earlier, in live action, some of these, like the telenovelas, you can definitely move quicker, but in animation, it's just the way it is. You can change your animation style, you can go to Flash, which will deliver it a little, could be a little bit quicker. So that we are doing that with some of our shows, where we are looking at Flash as an option to, uh, to have, it quick, have, it for, have it on our air faster. But it is... Um, and you wouldn't think of using digital to get there quicker with some pre-launch content prior to going to series? We do that, but I think it is about the volume of content when you can have it. It's like you could have one episode in-house, but it is really, if you need to feed that beast, which is, are these networks that just want more content, you need yeah. volume, and that is yeah. always going to okay. be. Athena, what's the big thing for this next 12 months? Well, I wish we were 24 hours. You know, I wish we had more time to offer up programming. I wish I had a 25-hour day so that I could balance my life. <laughs> and So bend and time, the, really. You know, time. But also, honestly, I, I just wish we had 
deeper pockets. I wish we had bigger, bigger budgets, and I wish it were 90, 1998 in that respect, because it was just a time that I don't think any of us realized how much money we were spending on shows, and it was just, oh, I'll take 52, and then we'll do a second season. It was a different time, and I don't think anyone took it for granted, but we miss it now because it's just forcing us to make decisions in a, in a different way, and it, it makes it a little harder. Yeah. And, and Paul, what, 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 what's the biggest problem you have to solve over the next year, do you think? I don't know if it's so much a problem, but more of a, a long-term concern, which is appealing to boys um, six to eight, or four to eight. I feel like uh, boys live in this interesting space where they go from preschool to walking dead. <laughs> And keeping them engaged in sort of the, the, the kid space with compelling content, I think, is, is, is challenging. Um, I think they mature so fast, and they don't want to live in that space. They want to go right to sort of some of the general uh, adult content. So it's finding the right content, and, and, and to the creative community here, figuring out how do you appeal to them? What are the stories you're going to tell? What are, what are the characters you're going to create? Because that's what you're competing with. It, you're not really, we all talk about just the kid space, but at the end of the day, the competition is anything that that boy is going to go to, and it's not just Nickelodeon cartoon uh, and, and Disney, you know, certainly from our brands, or you know, Super RTL. It's any opportunity they have to watch something else. Cool. Well, good luck with those missions. Uh, thank you all for being with us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the panel.